I'm going to be talking to you about the gate control theory of pain. Um, and first, let's talk about what pain is. So our brain is essentially a danger and error detecting machine. That's what it was designed to do to keep us alive. And pain at its most basic purpose is a danger signal. It's something that spurs us into action to keep ourselves safe and to protect whatever is injured so that it is allowed to heal. And so that's going to come back later on, that our brain is primed to detect danger. And I like this um, definition of pain because it includes emotional experience. I don't think anyone would argue that pain isn't an emotional experience. Um, and that pain influences our emotions. So I'm going to talk to you also about emotions influencing our pain, as well as biological, social, and other psychological factors all influencing our experience of pain. And because there's all these different factors, social, cultural, biological, so your own personal physiology, as well as um, your psychological factors, it helps explain why pain can be a subjective experience, why two people with the same injury can experience different levels of pain, or even why um, you know, some people experience no pain with the same kind of injury or damage in their body when someone else is pretty, um, is in pretty functionally limited. So we've been trying to figure out pain for a long time. Um, way back even to Plato, he had some theories about how pain worked. And he, one thing he was right about is that pain is processed in the brain. So he recognized that um, pain is, is transmitted through the body, but that ultimately something happens in the brain that has to do with what we're actually experiencing. And he actually thought the pain was an emotion. So he thought it was an emotional response to a prolonged and um, noxious stimulus. Much later on, um, the Cartesian dualistic theory came around. And between there, there was a lot of religious um, explanations for pain, many different ones. And, but once this theory came along, they started to look at pain as the result of either a physical injury or an emotional injury, but they didn't see the two things interacting with each other at all. So they were mutually exclusive, but they also recognized the brain had something to do with our experience of pain and that it was essential to processing pain. Then we went into the specificity theory, and this was the leading theory for a long time. And Charles Bell recognized that there were different types of sensory experiences. So there's pain and heat and touch and cold and, and recognized that difference, but wasn't able to um, connect kind of our emotional experience to our, our sensations. So he, did, he saw those things as separate still. Then pattern theory came around and this theory suggested that there wasn't a different type of sensory uh, nerve or sensory cell for each type of sense, but it was all one type of cell and what we experienced had to do with the pattern that, of that cell um, firing and, and sending message to our brain. We now know that is incorrect. That's not true. There is different types of sensory neurons that pick up different types of sensations. So then gate control, gate control theory came around, and this has been the most important theory in pain, probably, the, mo the thing that's advanced our understanding of pain the most significantly. And this theory suggests that pain is modulated by both stuff happening at the periphery, at the sensory level, as well as things happening at the brain level. And it viewed pain, first, first theory to view pain from the mind-body perspective, suggesting that there's both mind elements and body elements that influence our experience of pain. And that the way that pain signals are interpreted has to do with both the original stimulus as well as what's happening at the brain level. And so that's what we're talking about today. But before we get into that, let's talk about what we're talking about when we're saying the brain versus the peripheral nerves. The central nervous system is the brain and the spinal cord. Peripheral nerves are nerves that send signals to the brain and spinal cord and send signals away from the brain and spinal cord. The central nervous system is responsible for our perception of pain. So all of the pain signals that happen when you cut your finger and it travels up into the brain, that's all just electrical impulses until it gets to the brain and the brain actually interprets what's going on. So when we say 
brain, when I say pain is perceived versus just feeling pain, that's what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the perception of pain. What's happening when we actually recognize, oh, that hurts. That's happening at the brain level. Um, and so there are multiple systems in the brain involved in perception of pain. These include connections involving the spinal cord, the brain stem, thalamus, the limbic system, insular cortex, matter sensory cortex, motor cortex, and prefrontal cortex. And if there's any neuroscientists in the room, don't test me, but the limbic system might be thought of as our emotional system as well as our system to help us create memories. So when you think about it, that's an essential part of our pain perception and it's also our emotion center. So when we say pain and emotions go together, quite literally they share real estate in the brain. So they use the same, the same metrics, the same connections to process. Um, now there's several mechanisms involved in the activation of peripheral and central pathways that result in, and that can result in changes in how the spinal cord and the central nervous system process pain signals and can actually result in increasing our perception of pain or decreasing our perception of pain. This, these changes can be sort of more long lasting or they can be more momentary. The more long lasting changes are thought of as a central sensitization to pain. And this is a theory that our, our central nervous system and our peripheral nervous system gets sensitized to pain such that stuff that we would not necessarily feel as pain before the sensitization occurs now becomes a painful experience. Um, the good news is this process can be changed. We can change the way our brain works and the way our brain responds to pain. Just as it can ramp up the volume on pain, we can ramp it back down. So remembering that way back in the day, we didn't necessarily know that there was much going on at this, at this uh, spinal cord level and we just kind of thought that brain or excuse me pain <laughs> it was a sensation that our nociceptors picked up nociceptors are pain neurons pain signaling neurons they got sent to our afferent fibers that's just a, a, a transmission fiber in our body transmission neuron up to the spinal cord and into the brain and then we perceived pain once it came up there we now know that there's more to it than that um, uh, for a stimulus to get to the brain, it first has to get through three um, locations in the spinal cord. So it goes through the substantia gelatinosa, nerve fibers in the dorsal column, and transmission cells. You don't need to know all of that. The point is there's a gate, gating mechanism in the spinal cord that affects how much of those pain signals actually make it up into our brain and into our conscious awareness. The substantia gel gelatinosa, which is in the spinal cord, in the dorsal horn, modulates signals going to the brain. This is our gate, the substantia gelatinosa. So this is where all of our sensory um, neurons are coming into the spinal cord, this little piece of it. And so the sensation of pain is an interaction between these three components. And depending on how they're behaving, they can open the gate for more pain signals to come in and make it into the, into the, um, the brain and into our perception. They can also close the gate and, and, and uh, tune out some of the signals that might be coming in, stop them from making it to our per, uh, perception. And uh, a good way to demonstrate this is think about what it feels like to wear your clothing. Before I asked you that, you probably weren't necessarily aware of what it feels like to be wearing your clothing. When you start thinking about it, all of a sudden those perceptions, those sensations are making it into your conscious awareness. Pain is a little different than that. It's harder to ignore because it's a danger signal and our brain is an error and danger detecting machine. So it's harder for it to tune some of those out. Now, there's, as I said earlier, there's bottom up processes that influence pain. So from the bottom up level, say you get, you bump your knee and it hurts and then you rub it and it feels a little bit better, potentially, usually, that sensation of rubbing, that deep tissue rub is interrupting the pain signal, making it to the brain. So it is actually stopping some of that pain specific neuron signaling to make it into the, to the actual brain, to make it past those gatekeeping mechanisms. 
So that's why you can kind of have this bottom up process that can change the way your brain or your spinal cord really is interpreting some of those signals and what it's letting through. You also have the top down processing. So this is when we're talking about kind of more emotions and psychological well-being. Control mechanisms in the cortex are responsible for emotional and cognitive factors with pain, the connections between these different mechanisms. And we know from research that a negative emotional state amplifies the intensity of pain signals being sent to the brain. It opens the gate wide, turns the volume up. So feelings like depression, anger, stress, those are big offenders for opening the gate. As the gate is open to more signals and more signals are making it into the brain, you're more likely to perceive pain. And you're more likely to perceive more pain, more intense pain. So even if the pain is always there, a negative emotional state can make it feel more intense because quite literally more of that pain signal is making it into your perception, making it up to your brain. And like I said, danger signals, right? So some danger signals are associated with emotions as well. So if these are things like stress, anger, fear. These are danger signals also. So these also activate our brain to start scanning the environment for more danger and to pay more attention to the potential danger signals that are already there. So this is why stress, anger, and anxiety, in particular fear, can are, are specifically bad, you know, offenders for um, opening the gate and turning up the volume on pain because once once the stress is activated danger is activated in the brain it starts scanning the opposite is true also with pain pain is activated the danger center and it starts scanning for stress as well so you might notice when you're having a particularly bad pain flare that you have you feel more stressed same thing the opposite way if you have a stressful couple days you might also notice your pain is worse and this is what's happening Some of the factors that go into influencing pain are beyond some of those obvious ones. I know I've heard many times over that stress, anger, fear, those are ones that people identify with pretty readily as potentially influencing their pain experience. But there's a lot of other factors too. It's not just emotional, it's also behavioral, it's also cultural, it's also social. So diet influence pain, you know, both through inflammation, but also through our energy level, and through our emotions, how we feel about ourselves can often be affected by what we're eating. Sleep has a huge connection to pain. The comorbidity between sleep difficulty and chronic pain is huge. That's because pain can influence how well you can sleep just to get comfortable. It can have to do with medications. It can do with, again, this stress and this anxiety affecting our sleep, all sorts of reasons why pain can affect sleep, but also Poor sleep is directly correlated to pain increases, even in healthy people. So even in people who don't have chronic pain conditions, if they have some sleepless nights, they're going to feel worse. So if you add that on top of a pain condition that's already there, it's amplifying it, and it's opening that gate to pain. Beliefs is another powerful one. So what we believe is causing our pain, what our pain signifies is happening in our body. This can be really important to how we think about our pain and kind of how much we focus on it, how much we worry about it. And again, worry, danger signal, pain amplification. So thinking about the things that affect your worry and how much you're worried about something, especially your pain is important. You think you might've heard this before from people that hurt does not equal harm. And so doing something that hurts is not gonna harm you, but you know, of course, checking in with your doctors and physical therapists first. But if they've told you that, that you can do something, and even if it hurts, it's not harming you, that can be a comfort and, and allow you to engage in something without necessarily feeling stressed, feeling worried, and increasing your pain. If you believe it's gonna harm you to do stuff, it's gonna be a scary thing to do. It's gonna increase your awareness of your pain and really turn up the volume on the whole experience. We've talked about emotions and how negative emotion states can turn up the volume on pain positive emotion states can turn down the volume on pain as well. So you think about the last time you were really, felt really loved, felt really engaged in something, felt really passionate about something. Pain was probably there, but maybe not as loud, right? Environment can influence our pain. So we know that a paper cut hurts worse at work than it does at home. 
So what, what's going on in our environment, how we feel about being there, these things influence pain. Memories, especially memories if you had an injury, if that's something that you think about with regard to your pain, but also just pleasant memories and negative memories. So what is going through our mind affects how we experience our pain. Exercise, aerobic exercise is the number one thing you can do to reduce inflammation in your body, more so than diet, more so than anything. Um, but it also does things like release endorphins and lift our mood and make us feel better about ourselves. All of these things also close the gate. Being in a better body condition is gonna make it easier to move around, strengthening the muscles around your pain. So some of this is quite, you know, it's, it's physical. It's not just at the brain level. It's what's happening with your physiology. Your immune system. So inflammation, one of the purposes of inflammation is to cause pain. So say you have a cut, gets inflamed, and all of a sudden it's not just the cut that hurts, it's everything around it that hurts. So that's protecting you from damaging that further. So systemic inflammation is absolutely affecting your experience of pain. So making sure that you're aware of you know, what might cause inflammation, what might trigger your allergies, stuff like that, and paying attention to it. Perceptions. So again, kind of like beliefs, what we think our pain means, how we perceive our pain, that kind of thing, how other people perceive our pain, how other people perceive us as a person who has pain. All of these things can influence our experience of pain. Our health profile. So if you have other comorbidities, if you have, um, you know, if you have medications that cause side effects, if you have, you know, other things going on with your physiology that can influence not just pain, but the self-management behaviors around pain and kind of how aware you are of your pain and your health and all those things. Support. So the people we have around us really matter. So support, we know not just from pain, but from all kinds of health outcomes, feeling supported by the people in our environment helps us do better, helps us have better outcomes from procedures, from uh, medication treatments, from just how we feel about ourselves. So support can be something that falls off pretty quick when we have pain and we can't do as much stuff as we used to. So thinking about that as an important piece of pain management as well. We've talked a lot about stress. Stress is a danger signal. It's a huge one that influences pain, which is tough because pain is also stressful. And having a condition you have to manage is stressful. So it feeds into each other. But remembering that stress ultimately is telling your brain to pay attention to danger can help perhaps to recognize what's happening when you feel stressed out and you also feel more pain. Hydration is hugely important. I think joints are something like 80% water. And so if we have any joint issues, anything with the spine, tons of joints, it's very essential to drink a lot of water. And again, even in healthy people without pain conditions, if they get dehydrated, they're going to notice more pain, body pain, headaches, all kinds of things. So hydration, trying to get at least 64 ounces of water a day. Um, and then medical advice. We get conflicting medical advice sometimes. And that's confusing then what to do about it and what you should pay attention to and how you should manage it. Sometimes the advice we got at one time was valid at that time, but not anymore. And now we're not doing, now we're kind of not taking care of the things, not caring for ourselves in a way that is, is helpful for our pain condition. So medical advice also can have an influence. Now to drive this point home and think about stress, danger, environment, meaning behind pain, memories related to it, all of these different pieces. There's this example um, that talks about a battle in World War II. So, and I got this from uh, Dr. Thorne's uh, um, Cognitive Behavioral Therapy for Chronic Pain Manual, but she talks about this battle in Italy where it was an awful battle, the place was getting destroyed, and both the soldiers there and the townspeople were being injured. The soldiers getting injured needed significantly less painkillers to cope with the pain they were going through than the townspeople, and they believe that's because for them, getting injured meant they got to go home. So that meant they got to be safe, they got to go back to their family and escape danger. The people in that town, that was not true for and so they needed all the help they could get because there was no escape and that danger was still there for them. Another example 
Imagine you're walking down the street and you trip and sprain your ankle and you just won the lottery, right? How you think about that day, that pain, how much that pain bothers you is gonna be very different than if the exact same thing happened and you're on your way to the dentist, right? One would be a reason to potentially take the day off and that really hurts and I can't do anything and you know, this is an awful day and look at how this happened versus, oh yeah, I sprained my ankle, but guess what else happened? You know, so it's the environment, it's our thoughts, it's what's going on, it's all these things kind of influence our experience, right? Um, and then there's, so I talked about how there's things you can do to change what's happening in your brain, change the way your brain is responding to pain. And there's some factors that close the gate. So you can think about how these might apply to yourselves. There's physical factors. So making sure you're taking care of your physical body, making sure you're respecting your body, taking care of your physiology, making sure that um, you're doing your homework as far as seeking out appropriate medical interventions and adhering to them, right? There's also relaxation techniques, and we'll talk a little bit more about that specifically, but relaxation techniques to change what is happening in your body at the nervous system level. You can challenge difficult or negative thinking by having more balanced thoughts. So recognizing that our thinking affects our pain, our beliefs about our pain affects our pain, all these things then challenging those with perhaps a more balanced thought or a thought that you know, is not as, as negative as perhaps the first one that pops in. This is tough, this takes some effort and some learning. So I'm, I'm giving you these ideas, but keep in mind that these do take some, some effort to change these things. There's also just distraction and focus on other things. That's a perfectly active, great coping strategy when you need it, you know? Getting involved in something that matters to you that is diverting can help to train our brain away from focusing on pain. Emotions, so again, challenging negative thoughts, doing what you can do to promote a more um, balanced and well psychological well-being. So through exercise, through relaxation, through doing things that you just enjoy doing. So again, using behavior to affect our emotions. Do stuff you like doing, even if you're not necessarily in a good mood, usually helps at least lift your mood a little bit. And as you engage in activity, remembering that both over and under activity can increase pain. So under activity causes deconditioning, makes us feel worse about our lives, makes us feel disconnected from things that matter to us. All of that is bad for pain, but so is overdoing it. So going, doing too much at once and then crashing and then doing too much at once and then crashing, also not great for pain. So trying to approach activity with a more paced kind of uh, approach that respects your body but also gets, allows you to do what you want to do. Um, and then positive time with friends and family. So fostering that social health in your life, making sure that you are engaging with things that matter to you, activities that matter to you, people that matter to you, paying attention to that stuff. Also perhaps paying attention that, you know, if certain situations or people really ramp up your volume on pain, maybe you pay attention to what's going on there and see, you know, kind of what might be influencing your pain now that you know all these different things can. I want to talk about relaxation specifically. Relaxation is kind of a, a, a catch-all tool for closing the gate on pain. So when we talked about how nervous system signaling has to do with how pain gets to our brain and then how our brain interprets pain, and there's when we talk about things that turn up the volume on pain, they're really activating our sympathetic nervous system. So they're activating this fight or flight response, activating the danger centers in our brain and creating this cascade of physical reactions that ramp up our stress, ramp up our, you know, our negative emotions and, and then ultimately ramp up our pain. It also causes physical changes like racing heart, muscle tension and, you know, and muscle tension in and of itself can definitely increase our pain and pull on different areas of our body that are painful. So as we're in pain chronically, we're kind of in this chronic state of fight or flight, chronic stressed state. So it, our brain is primed really to be open to pain signals, to have that gate open. And it 
as we are in pain, again, not our fault, it's a danger signal. Our brain is interpreting that danger and telling us we better watch out because there's danger. So we're in this fight or flight mode, not by any choice, but because that's just how our brain interprets what's going on. We can counteract that by practicing relaxation. So practicing activating our parasympathetic nervous system through things like diaphragmatic breathing, through pleasurable activities, through meaningful activities, and recognizing that purposeful, active relaxation is a skill that you learn and you build on. So diaphragmatic breathing is breathing deep into your belly. It's belly breathing. It's flattening out that diaphragm muscle under your ribs and taking that deep breath so your lungs expand down there. You would never breathe this way if there was actually a tiger. So this is why it teaches your brain to calm down. It's kind of pumping the brakes on that nervous system activation and Jedi mind tricking your brain through what your body's doing to not be as stressed out. It's essentially saying you need to calm down your focus on the danger signals because we're fine. We wouldn't be breathing this way if we weren't fine. And so that's what that deep breathing relaxation is doing. And it's the counter to the activation of pain is the deactivation through these relaxed breaths, through, these, um, through uh, practicing relaxation regularly and strengthening the connections in your brain so that it's more easy to relax. So it gets better. Whatever you do all the time, your brain gets better at and more efficient at. So the more you practice relaxation, the better your brain gets at doing it. It gets better at turning off that activation. It gets better at recovering faster from stress. So you'll find that if you were to practice deep breathing over a long period of time, you would find that you were perhaps less reactive to stress, perhaps less reactive to anger, and perhaps you'd feel less pain overall. So it kind of helps us keep a little bit more calm in the face of some stress. You would want to recognize the goal. Those are danger signals, those emotions. We want to feel them. They're important to feel and to interpret, but then we want to get over them, right? We don't, we don't want to keep holding on to them. So that's kind of the purpose of diaphragmatic breathing is the recovery from those emotions and from pain. Research suggests that 20 minutes a day is the, is the golden number. So 20 minutes a day of deep breathing is, seems to be the amount that has helpful. Doing more than that isn't going to hurt you, but it's maybe not necessary. Um, practice is key with deep breathing. Just like you wouldn't wait until you had your recital to play <coughs> piano on stage, you would practice that a lot before you got on stage and needed to know how to do it. Just like deep breathing, you practice when you're feeling well, you're feeling calm, you're not in necessarily a lot of pain or stress, so that when you are in those states, it's easier to use. You already know how to do it. You don't have to practice in the moment because you've done it before. And you want to think about it like a medication. You've got to dose yourself every day to get the benefit from it, right? So just like you would you wouldn't necessarily skip medications for days at a time and then expect to feel better. Same with deep breathing. You got to kind of dose yourself, teach your brain, strengthen those connections daily to help you feel better. And then as you keep doing this down the road, a couple weeks down the road of doing this every day, that's when you might really notice the changes. So I encourage you to think about your own experiences, get curious, you know, think about, is this make sense to me or is this, this is too far out there or something. Do I have factors in my own life that turn up the volume on my pain? How about factors that turn it down? So just pay attention to that stuff. Recognize what your experience is so that then you can make choices and be more deliberate kind of, of how you're navigating your pain experience. Now finally, if you're wanting to learn more about this stuff, there's a couple different things you can do. So you can go back and read some of the original um, articles on the theory. And if that interests you, I encourage you to do it. It's very interesting um, and much more technical than I went into the details of. But there's also some other resources for you. So the Curable app is a great, resources, a great resource to get started on more of this pain neuroscience education. So more about this idea of 
pain being a danger signal, nervous system activation, the different ways that our brain can open that gate to pain. So the Curable app goes into more detail about that. It also has some intro to coping skills, so some thought restructuring, so addressing negative thinking, negative thoughts, as well as some expressive writing exercises and different things that you can do to kind of get in touch with your experience of pain and the different factors that influence your pain. It is, there is a subscription fee for it, we don't make any money from it. So disclaimer, there's a fee, but I'm not selling you anything. Um, then there's also some, you know, if you're interested in getting into group psychology, we have some excellent groups here in our clinic. So we have coping skills groups where you learn some more things like activity pacing and deep breathing skills and cognitive restructuring skills and stuff like that, challenging thoughts. There's um, groups, the same group, but it combines with Tai Chi, so you get a movement component. We have some, we have a group, group that addresses both sleep difficulties and pain, so you get both CBT, cognitive behavioral therapy for chronic pain, as well as CBT for insomnia. So if you struggle with both those things, it's a great way to attack both at once. We have a back in action group, which is our most intense group, and you get two you meet twice a week and you get, it's four hours each and you get both combined physical therapy, medical education and pain psychology. So that's quite an intense one and people really get the best results from that one if they're able to make that time commitment. Then there's also pain and purpose, which is an acceptance and commitment therapy group. And this is, um, this addresses more of uh, what do you do when nothing else is working and how do you still lead a meaningful life and do the things that matter to you? There's also an emotion focus group. So again, emotions are hugely important to our experience of pain. And so addressing them and understanding our emotions and understanding our motivations and how our emotions affect us can be really important for managing pain as well. And then I left these off the slide, but we also have one-time classes where you learn a lot of the tools and um, self-management skills in one shop. Not as close to pain psychology because you don't get to come back and kind of talk about what worked or not, but it can be great for people who are busy or live far away and have a hard time making it every week. And then finally, as mentioned at the beginning, we have, well, the ACPA has support groups. So recognizing if you might need some more support around your pain condition, or you just might want to connect with people who might understand what you're going through, that's a great, a great group to go to. And I believe they also allow you to bring family so you can have a support system that comes with you to that.